Hey guys, this is Nick, and in this video, I want to talk about Ron Perlman and Revlon. He used to be considered America's richest man, and now there's all these stories that he is selling his jet and his home in the Hamptons and his artwork. And he says it's to simplify his life, but a lot of people say that his wealth has decreased a lot because of his stake in Revlon going down like 70% in the last two years or so. So a lot of people think he's having a cash crunch. I'm going to talk about that as well as if Revlon is going broke. And I'm going to talk about the lessons you can learn from this billionaire in his spending habits, how you can avoid some of the same traps he has. Now, most people will never have this problem of a $100 million yacht or $50 million paintings, but you can learn on your own level uh, not to do the same kinds of things that he has done. Now, for people who are not familiar with Ron Perlman, it's not the actor, it's the financier. He's known as a leverage buyout kind of guy that was in his heyday during uh, Michael Milken and the junk bonds. They did a lot of leverage buyouts. He uh, owned Marvel Comics at one time as well as a lot of other companies and so yes he was considered the richest man in the world in the 1990s this is before like bill gates and microsoft really got up there high enough uh he was probably in the leagues with sam walton at the time something along those levels uh recently there's a story about revlon that is trying to get their certain bondholders to agree to sell back their bonds at a discount. They are currently offering $325 for every $1,000 of notes they submit, but the bonds are changing hands at $33.87. So this is a discount to what they can get in the market. And Revlon is saying that if investors don't do this and turn in their bonds, that they may not get paid at all. Um, so why am I talking about this? Because Revlon seems to me to be one of those companies that is always on the verge of bankruptcy and always threatening to be insolvent or not be able to pay their debts. And so this article here is in 2020. Let's go back 20 years ago and see what they were doing back then. Here is an article from Barron's back in January 29th, 2001. And it's a little complicated, but basically Revlon had these bonds, $770 million worth of zero coupon debt that were issued in 1997. And the collateral was 20% of Ron Perlman's 42 million Revlon shares. And they had a face value of 15 cents at the time because of Revlon stock dwindling. And Ron Perlman went in and secretly bought up 630 million dollars worth of the notes at a very low price about 175 million so a big discount and for the rest of the 140 million he uh revlon offered to buy it back from the bond holders and they offered a really bad deal uh imp imputed yield of 12 percent at the time and so it was just a bad deal and what they say down here is saying that moreover the offering of the new notes is extraordinarily coercive unless all old note holders exchange for the new notes rev holding says that it might default on both the new and old notes and even file for chapter 11. so <laughs> this what he was doing 20 years ago they're still doing today and revlon is still in business uh I don't, i'm not sure how but uh, nothing has changed that much. I'll tell you what has changed, though. What has changed is the reason that they're saying Revlon is struggling. Back in 2001, it says, Nor has Revlon been successful in peddling its wares to dominant mass market retailers like Walmart and Target. It says, all in all, the company has steady loss market share to bigger more solidly financed competitors such as Procter & Gamble's CoverGirl and Oil of Olay and L'Oreal's Maybelline. So here they're saying the reason for their problems is because of these big solidly financed competitors. 
Let's see what they blame their problems on today. In this October 19, 2020 article where Revlon threatens that the bondholders may not get paid if they don't agree to the exchange that they're offering, they say that the reason that Revlon is struggling because of competition from SD Lauder, which obviously is a big company, and a host of smaller companies that have used social media to lure away customers, kind of like Kylie Jenner and all these Instagram influencer type of smaller boutique cosmetic companies. So back in 2000, they were blaming the big companies. Now they're blaming the really small companies. Now, if Ron Perlman has to sell his yacht and his private jet and his expensive paintings, will he still be able to survive? Well, luckily he will because I don't know if you know, but back in 1999, when he was being divorced by one of his eventually five wives and she was trying to get more money for child support, he famously said that he could feed his four-year-old daughter on just $3 a day. And so this made like the front page of a lot of New York papers, like I think the New York Post and maybe the Daily News. And he says, when his daughter Kaylee eats with me, she eats $3 worth of food a day. She eats chicken, fingers, hot dogs, and cereal for breakfast, hamburgers, and some pasta. So $3, so about $1,000 a year would be appropriate. Beslow asked, I guess that's the lawyer for the wife, and Perlman said yes. <laughs> So, uh, you know, don't feel sorry for the wife. The wife was seeking $50,000 a month in child support and 40000 for rent and 60000 for a full-time nanny and all this stuff. That's, you know, rich people problems. But uh, it's pretty funny that he's kind of known for that famous quote about feeding his kids on $3 a day. And uh, apparently he still has two young kids now from, I guess, his fifth wife. So... If it comes down to it, he can always go back to the $3 chicken fingers and hot dogs and some pasta, I guess. And just a few months ago, they were talking about that he was selling his assets not because he needed the money, but because he wanted to, you know, spend more time with his family, like all CEOs say when they're going to step down or they're fired or something. Uh, so he is selling his yacht called c2 which is listed for about 100 million dollars or 90 million euros uh, it was built in 2009 and can accommodate 31 guests and a crew of 27 as a swimming pool <laughs> retractable movie screen so let's take a look at that so he went from this huge yacht to all of a sudden trying to simplify his life and sell off his assets and stuff like that you know, maybe he is maybe he is and i don't know Here's some pictures of inside the yacht. And the strange thing is some of the pictures in the bedrooms like this, the hammer and sickle, which is the symbol of communist Russia that was on the communist Russian flag. Uh, and to show that it's probably not just a coincidence, he also has, let's see here, communist leader, Chairman Mao from China on another wall. So what's going on here? Maybe he's had a change of heart of all his leverage buyouts and wants to sell his boat and give it to all the poor people of the world or something who knows <laughs> i doubt it but i i find it kind of strange that he has that in the yacht and he is also in the process of selling his gulfstream 650 and crates of his artwork and he already sold a stake in am general and a flavorings company that he owned for decades and he has hired banks to sell stock he owns in other companies. And what is interesting here is the art that he was selling was Jasper John's zero through nine, worth $70 million. Let's take a look at that. This is $70 million. This is a stencil of the numbers zero through nine, just stenciled over each other. The other one is two candles worth 50 million dollars let's take a look at that this must be uh, amazing right well <laughs> this is it this is your <laughs> this is what 50 million dollars gets you two candles not even not even three candles only two for 50 million and last but not least you have this other one leaving Paphos ringed with waves i don't even know what that means but it's estimated to be worth 20 million so let's see what that looks like 
So this is what 20 million gets you in this painting here. So Perlman himself said he's been very public about trying to reduce leverage, streamline operations, sell some assets, convert those assets to cash, seek new investment opportunities and all that kind of stuff. And he says, I realize that far, for far too long, I've been holding on to too many things that I don't use or even want. I conclude it's time for me to clean house, simplify, and give others the chance to enjoy some of the beautiful things that I've acquired, just as I have for decades. Uh, and they also say that some of these things have loan, a lot of these assets have loans through Citibank and some other banks, although they did deny that he is selling his 57 acre estate in the Hamptons. Perlman is known as a financial engineer in the 1980s and 1990s, and he was really aggressive leverage buyouts and all that kind of thing. Uh, but what's interesting here is, and here's another lesson, is he paid $1.74 billion for Revlon back in the 1980s. I believe it was 1985 to be specific. And now it's worth about $279 million. So over 35 years, he's lost, I don't, I don't know, what is that, 70% of the value or something like that from their purchase price, maybe 80% or so. Uh, and so I'm going to compare what he could have done just by buying the S&P 500 index from 1985 till now, how much more he would have. Here it says, all told, at least nine banks have claims against Perlman's assets, including his art collection, house in the Hamptons, and various aircraft. There are $267 million in mortgages linked to his Upper East Side headquarters from McAndrews and Forbes. Perlman's art collection makes up about a third of his fortune, and those are very hard to sell in an illiquid market when everybody's trying to sell, so that's not the best thing to have if you're trying to sell in a fire sale. And here it says, despite the spin on Perlman's fire sales as being a way to spend more time with family, Perlman has his skeptics, including Richard Hack, who wrote a book about him in 1996, and Hack says, if you want a simpler life, you go buy a farm in Oklahoma, not sell a painting out of your townhouse in Manhattan. If he's selling his art, it's because he needs cash. And Zero Hedge says, we can imagine the same is true about his yacht. So what are some of the lessons you can learn from a billionaire like Ron Perlman? Even though 99.99% .99 of us will never have these level of problems, you can still learn a lot from what he's experiencing here. And I would say the first one is diversify, don't bet the farm, and don't fall in love with a stock. And what I mean by that is a lot of people say that Revlon is like his baby, but it's also like the stone around his neck. He has been doing everything he can to keep this thing alive for all these years. And a lot of people say it's because of the limelight that it affords him. So he gets to be around all kinds of famous people and models and everything because he owns Revlon and has to deal with that kind of crowd. He would not get to be in those circles probably if he just owned some small manufacturing plant in the Midwest that was highly profitable or something along those lines. So let's see what he's been giving up by holding Revlon all this time and not just investing it in, say, a broad index like the S&P 500. And so he bought Revlon in 1985 for $1.74 billion. So here's the S&P 500 in 1985. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's under 200. So let's call it 200, even though it's lower. Right now, the S&P is at 34.65. So about 17 times his money, uh, that's about $30 billion that he would have had just by buying and holding the S&P 500 index instead of paying $1.74 billion, uh, $1 billion for Revlon, and now it's only worth $279 million. So this is the problem of falling in love with the stock and not diversifying. This is Revlon going back to... 1997 it was 525 dollars obviously it never traded there they probably had some reverse splits along the way and now it's five dollars and 29 cents <laughs> so 
not the nicest chart. This is kind of like the exact opposite of the S&P 500 over the last 20 years. So again, you should always diversify. Don't bet it all on one thing, especially if you're tying up a large portion of your net worth into something. Another lesson you can learn is that change is always happening and usually the big entrenched companies don't see that trend coming quick enough and lose out to it. Like with the cosmetics manufacturers, the big ones are losing out to these small, nimble social media advertising type of cosmetic companies. Uh, the same could be kind of said for a big company like Budweiser that has been losing out to small craft brewing wine and spirits companies as well. So it's the same kind of thing where they're so big and they see these small risks on the radar, but they don't think it's worth it. They don't want to cannibalize their sales. So they leave it alone until it gets so big that it really starts to affect their bottom line. The third lesson you can learn from Ron Perlman's situation is that you can always go broke. There is always some amount of money you can spend, no matter how rich you are, to finally put yourself in a financially bad situation. And so you should think about that every time you think you have a certain amount of money and now you can start spending on frivolous things you don't need, like uh, these multi million dollar paintings of things that a 10 year old can replicate in kindergarten or something like that. Uh, does he really need this stuff? Uh, no, obviously he doesn't. And if he really wanted to, he could hire an art student for $50 or $100 to replicate this thing and hang it up in his townhouse. And most people would think it's the real deal anyway. So uh, it's a slippery slope. And a lot of people fall into this trap is the more money they make, the more money they spend instead of saving it for a rainy day and uh, being just more secure in what you can do with your life instead of just chasing bigger and bigger objects like a bigger house a bigger plane a bigger boat uh, more expensive paintings and all that stuff if he didn't have any of this i'm sure his life would be pretty much the same because he lives a, a pretty good life and he could rent the boat if he wants once in a while you really get to see <laughs> um, how quickly this can unravel if you are holding a lot of things that are very difficult to sell and the proverbial you know 100 year storm hits like we have now if everybody is losing money and can't pay their mortgages and businesses are shutting down probably not a lot of people looking to buy paintings like this or two candles or something along those lines especially for the prices that he paid for them don't fall into that trap of upgrading your lifestyle with increasing revenue and increasing income save it because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or a year from now if you're going to buy stuff buy stuff that appreciate in value or pay you income like real estate and that kind of thing and just to be clear no matter how much ron perlman loses he's still going to be richer than 99.9% .9 of the population. He's not going to be broke. His kids are not going to be eating $3 worth of chicken fingers just to save money or anything along those lines. He's going to be just fine. Uh, you can't say the same for Revlon stockholders or bondholders, but he will be okay. So don't start a GoFundMe page for Ron Perlman just yet, okay? So if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. Thanks for watching, guys.